Welcome to the dark stream, Vox Day, voxday.net, and unauthorized.tv. Thanks for tuning in. I've already got nearly 10 folks on unauthorized, and I'm told audio and video are good by the uh, by the DLive folks. So um, it's going to be an interesting uh, conversation tonight, I think, because. Uh, there's obviously been a tremendous amount of stuff going on a lot of crazy stuff coming out about the uh, the Gaza attacks what people knew about it who didn't know um, what happened what didn't happen uh, you know the mainstream media has been uh, completely over the top I mean we thought Ukraine was over the top but it doesn't even begin to compare with uh, with what we're seeing just in, in three days after these Gaza attacks, you know, which, um, you know, compared to, it's really remarkable because if you compare the number of people that have uh, unfortunately perished um, on both sides with the Israelis and the Palestinians, it doesn't even begin to come close to how many Ukrainians are dying, you know, on a, a weekly, if not daily basis. Um, but let's face it, if you're looking for people to put things in perspective, uh, the very last people you can expect to hear that from is the mainstream media. They have their job to do, they're doing their job. Uh, you have a job to do too, which is to not believe everything they tell you. So I thought this would, this might amuse some of you. Uh, you probably saw it today on the blog possibly on Gab. Uh, ben Shapiro, pondering the question of whether he will finally defend Israel as an Israeli soldier. No, he reluctantly concludes. My work here lecturing Americans is simply too important. Now, I find this amusing because, you know, I called Ben Shapiro out as a chicken hawk back in 2005. He was like 18 years old, 19 years old, um, obviously of an age to serve in the military. And he was running around writing columns on, on Town Hall and uh, World Net Daily talking about how the United States should invade Syria, Iran, uh, Lebanon, uh, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia because it is right and good to create an empire. Um, and of course, he's he's saying this when he's of an age to enlist. But did he enlist to, to uh, work towards that most important goal of creating U.S. empire? No, of course not. You know, neo clowns are absolutely and utterly contemptible. And to make matters worse, and and, and people are really feeding him his own words. He actually said that back in 2002, he didn't care about civilian deaths. You know, who cares about civilian deaths? He said the, the, the life of, what was it, you know, uh, I can't remember exactly, it was like the life of a, a hundred uh, Palestinian civilians is not worth the life of one Israeli soldier. Well, then why do you expect anyone to give a flying fragment of a rat's ass about some Israeli civilians getting killed. You know, if you don't care about any civilians but your own, and I'm not saying that that's not a legitimate and historical perspective. That's been true of, oh, I don't know, pretty much every tribe since the beginning of time. But why does he expect anyone to give a damn about his people? He doesn't care about anyone else's. You know, and 
and these these guys are just so unself aware you know totally unself conscious and of course you know they have no sense of history no sense of of what's going on i mean the the most the single most ironic thing is that they don't think that they can be criticized because they uh, some of their people suffered a partial genocide um, you know 70 years ago right and yet their entire claim to the very land that they're claiming the very their very justification for that land is based on a genocide that they committed by their own account. You know, the land of Canaan did not belong to the Jews. It belonged to the Canaanites. And then the funniest thing is that, well, you know, God, God told us that we could kill all of them, all of them and take it. You're an atheist. I mean, the, the, the total absurdity of the, the arguments is, is just nonsensical. Now, don't get me wrong. I do support the state of Israel. I do support Israel you know, being able to defend itself. You know, there needs to be a Jewish nation somewhere. And the only question is, do you, do you want it in New York? Do you want it in Hollywood? Or do you want it where a lot of them want to live in Jerusalem? Fine. You know? But the reality is, is that there's also the Palestinians there. And so, um, you know, th there has to be found a solution that doesn't involve lethal violence because, you know, at least, you know, it, from a uh, pro-Israel perspective, no, I'm probably not talking very long. Um, you know, you're not going to win over time. Just because you've been successful in the past doesn't mean that you're going to be successful in the future. History is absolutely littered with kingdoms and empires that have fallen over time, you know, after long periods of time. The Sumerians, the Babylonians, the Romans, you know, the Ottomans, right? Um, and so that, but you know, I've, I've talked to uh, some of my friends in Israel and they're a little bit, I won't say despairing, but they are a little bit concerned about the complete lack of long-term thinking over there, which is exactly backwards what um, you know, people tend to think. But... Um, you know, there's not a lot of evidence of that because it's pretty clear that this event in Gaza, um, to whatever extent it's real, and the reason that I say that there is a question of that it's real is because they've already discovered that the girl who was plastered all over the media and was reported as being dead is apparently alive. And they're pretty much breaking out uh, every bad guy narrative that they can come up with. We don't actually have the um, we don't actually have the uh, babies and newborns in the incubators that we got before. But uh, you know there was this <laughs> there's this um, something about you know forty babies were beheaded. You know, now we don't know, 
maybe they were, but um, uh, <laughs> that sounds way too much like the Iraqi incubators. You know what I mean? Um, and pro probably the saddest was, you know, I know, we'll, we'll tell them that Hamas shot a dog. <laughs> like, have you met the U.S. police? <laughs> I mean, if if going to if if absolutely obliterating a people is justified because they shot a dog, there wouldn't be many police stations surviving in the United States. We have a super chat here uh, from Bugbear. Thank you, Bugbear. Says thank you for the stream. I've been intentionally avoiding information on the subject. Well, it's probably just as well that you do because there's all kinds of all kinds of nonsense um, being promulgated by the mainstream media. And, and what do we know about the, me the media? What's the one thing we know about the official story in the mainstream media? It's not true. It is going to be at least substantially false in some details. So we don't know, you know. It could be worse than, than it's reported in some ways. It could be better than it's reported in some ways. But you can't believe, and I mean, <laughs> there was actually uh, some comment or statement came out on Twitter and they said, um, <laughs> Hamas is putting out these videos of these terrible, terrible acts and they're too terrible for us to show you. And I'm thinking, well, number one, if Hamas is putting them out on social media, then presumably somebody else besides you has them. And number two, no one's going to believe anything you say if you don't show it. And here's the other thing that really bothers me about all of the uh, videos and stuff. Um, how come nobody who puts up video, how come no one who films video over there has resolution that's better than like 640 by 480 or whatever? I mean, you know, I have 500 horse, goat, and dog videos on my very old phone. And if I were to show them to you, the resolution is very high. It's very crisp. For some reason, absolutely nothing happens that involves violence in the Middle East that, that uh, is filmed with any sort of reasonably modern resolution. I, I genuinely don't get it, you know. It's kind of funny because apparently it's filmed by the same people, and this might be telling, it's apparently filmed by the same people that film um, uh, like Hollywood stars. Like, if you ever have you ever noticed that like whenever a, a woman, some Hollywood actress, you know, films a little thing of her, you know, posing in a in her Oscar outfit or something. The resolution is always terrible. And so, you know, was some of the stuff staged? It some of it looks that way. You know, Miles Mathis uh, put together a collage of the pictures of the reported female victims of the uh, the rave incident. And let's just say you could probably go to a high-end nightclub in, in New York or Los Angeles or in, even in you know, Stockholm or Oslo, and you would not find that many attractive women. It literally looked like a bunch of call sheets, a bunch of headshots uh, from models and wannabe actresses. Now, 
you know, no disrespect to, um, you know, to our, our friends in Israel, but, uh, you know, they don't tend to be as attractive as say like the Scandinavians, right? So when you see a collage of like 40 women who, you know, look more like Natalie Portman or Bar Israel, whatever her name is, um, then say, you know, the kind of people you would see walking down the street in New York City, you have to be a little bit skeptical. I mean, I suppose it's theoretically possible, but, you know, and, and Miles Mathis may be a, a bit of a lunatic. Um, he may be, he may be prone to uh, seeing conspiracies under every couch. But when you look at the, uh, you know, he's a painter. He, anyone who is a painter has an eye for detail that goes far, far beyond the human norm. And if even I can see it, it's not a surprise that he took one look and went, this is not, you know, whatever else happened, this didn't. And so, um, Frankie says, it seems like it's getting increasingly difficult to stage these atrocities. No wonder they want to shut down the internet. Well, it is because everybody's got a camera. Everybody's got a high res camera. And so, and the, the cameras are high res enough to show all kinds of details that are going to reveal little problems that, um, it's very difficult to, uh, predict and avoid. So, um, but the thing is, it's, it's obviously not a false flag. You know, there might be some false flag elements. Some of the things that, um, <laughs> yeah, some of these things might have been filmed in 2014 based on the video quality. Um, but it's definitely what I call a green flag. Ironic Keyboard points out they shut Periscope down quickly when citizen journalism exploded. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, and YouTube obviously is very tightly controlled. You know, video channels tend to be very tightly controlled for that reason. But, um, but the thing is, is that most importantly, we have logic. Every single time you have a, uh, a country that wants to engage in military action, it is customary for them to either engage in a false flag or more increasingly uh, these days, um, you see something like Pearl Harbor, like 9-11, like these attacks that I would refer to as a green flag. People seem to like that term. They seem to, it's, it's, it, it's, it makes sense. You know, it's it's a it's a rhetorical thing, but but it it fits the dialectic. Um, Powers of Bear says, yeah, green flag is so intuitive that you really don't have to even explain its meaning. And, and so that's why people find it very credible when there's reports of Egyptian intelligence um, having told Netanyahu directly that. Um, that there was no, uh, um, that something was coming out of Gaza. Uh, you know, people are beginning to rediscover, and I say rediscover because we've known it all along, that Mossad funded Hamas and was involved in, in establishing Hamas. And so, um, you know, is it, really outside the realm of possibility that that the Israeli intelligence agencies have some people in Hamas. I mean, of course they have people in Hamas. You know, we know they've got people in the White House. How difficult can it be for them to have people in, you know, in Gaza, the West Bank? 
I mean, that, that's how they get most of their intelligence. And here's the funniest thing, and this is why it's so dangerous to lie. The reason it's so dangerous to lie about stuff is that it essentially eliminates your ability to not just tell the truth, but even talk later. Think about this. The very next day, Netanyahu announces that they are launching, uh, or they're going to bomb all these residences because they knew that that's where the Hamas leadership lived. So let me get this straight. You know where they are. You know where they live. Your intelligence is so good that you know where the, they are at all times, but you have no idea that they're planning an attack of this magnitude. You'd need at least a thousand people, given the number of, of attackers reported, and all the support required for it, you need at least a thousand people to know what's going on. There's no way. There's no way. Matty Ice points out, it's odd that people have no problem believing others can commit atrocities, but not allow them. Well, I think a lot more people understand post-COVID that governments are perfectly willing to kill their own citizens. Now, this should not be a surprise. You know, I went to uh, I went to write a book called "The Red Hand of Government," and it was um, it was focused on the the death toll of all the people that the government had killed its own people, and you know, I proved that you're much more likely to be killed by your own government than by any uh, soldiers or accidents or anything else. You know, if you're a human being on the planet, the most dangerous thing to you is your own government. Contiki says U.S. or all, go all governments. And so why, <laughs> given that this is the most lethal danger to any human on the planet. How is it a reasonable response to say, well, no, no, the Israeli government would never permit its citizens to be, to be slaughtered. The Israeli government would never allow terrorists to enter freely and take out people in the settlements people in the illegal settlements who are a massive pain in the ass to the Israeli government. Hmm. Furthermore, if a bunch of these people who are a major pain in the ass to the US government or to the, to the Israeli government are attacked and killed, then we can pursue our objectives. We want to have an excuse to ethnically cleanse Gaza. We want to have an excuse to go to war with Iran. Now, let's just build a hypothetical scenario here. This is just a, yeah, and, 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 and they vaxxed most of the people anyhow. They vaxxed them. So you're going to tell me that they, they really care about protecting them. That's their big priority is protecting them when they're taking a break from poisoning them. When they're taking a break from significantly reducing their life expectancy. Powers that bear. Zionists are trying to claim that even if they knew, it was the right decision because they can kill 20 times more Palestinians. Yeah, um... Those are the retarded Zionists. <laughs> they, again, the, some of these people have no self-awareness. They don't understand how that sounds to literally everyone else. Yeah, I have absolutely no doubt 
that the Israeli Defense Forces have no problem you know, more than accounting for themselves against the Palestinians. Fair enough. They probably still account for themselves pretty well against the other Arab nations. You know, but the great Israeli general Moshe Dayan, uh, who is actually acquainted with my uncle Chuck, um, he was once asked, what is the secret for the amazing success of the Israeli Defense Forces? And Dayan said, fighting Arabs. You know, even the U.S. military doesn't grasp yet how overrated it is. I'm not saying the IDF. The IDF is overrated. But the U.S. military is overrated too. You know, the scale of the warfare is so much bigger on the Eastern Front, both in World War II and today, that the U.S. military is not prepared for it. Not, not only not prepared for it, is not even able to fight on that scale. You know, all of the, you know, all of the fighting that went on. And, you know, the U.S. military acquitted itself well. But they were fighting like the C team that didn't have any resources, didn't have any numbers. You know, it was a totally different experience than the Germans had um, fighting the, the Soviets. And the Russians have as, um, I think it's, uh, what's his name? It's not Simplicius. Um, it's another site that I read. But he points out that the Russians have a 400-year history of a military academy. Their military doctrine is deep. It's rich. They know what they're doing in a way that the United States doesn't and can't. And this isn't even accounting for all the woke bullshit. This isn't even accounting for all the social justice nonsense. No, it's not Big Serge, although I read him too. Um, you know, but you know, the, the world is not what we think it is for the most part. You know, you've got small regional powers, you've got big regional powers, you know. Um, yeah, maybe it was Andrei Martyonov. Uh, Matty I says, Andre really put the disparity in Russian and U.S. military tradition in perspective for me. Yeah, it was it was kind of shocking to me, too, just because, you know, I grew up in the U.S. military tradition, specifically the U.S. Marine Corps. Um, you know, my great uncle actually wrote some of the stuff that is doctrine, and obviously, as a, as a publisher of both William S. Lind and Martin Van Creveld, you know, I'm pretty deeply steeped in it for an amateur. But, you know, the, the Russian stuff compared to, and, and not all the Russian stuff is translated, most of it is not even translated, but the Russian stuff is like an NFL game book compared to a high school football's game book. Contiki's got an excellent question. Why didn't you go into the military, especially West Point? Well, first of all, uh, there's not a chance I would have gone to West Point. Um, I was under a fair amount of pressure to go to the Naval Academy. I had the senatorial recommendations. Um, you know, I would have gotten in easily. And fortunately, um, my uncle, who was, you know, a, a uh, general in the Marine Corps at the time, said, uh, I don't think that he should go. Um, 
and uh, and I was very grateful to that. My mom was so my mom was so angry at him. She's like, "Why are you telling? You know, we've been trying to, you know, we've been preparing him for this all the, his whole life." And my uncle very wisely said, uh, "He will probably get kicked out within the first two days." He's, he's too much of a rebel. It's not going to work. And, you know, it was, it was kind of tough for him because one of his sons did go um, and ended up, you know, washing out after, after two years. Some people just are not, you know, very well suited for it. Um, and then afterwards, you know, I did actually, I, I mean, I've, told this story before um, my best friend and I did go down when uh, uh, after we graduated from college um, then there was uh, Desert Shield it wasn't Desert Storm but Desert Shield and you know my grandfather had enlisted the day after World after Pearl Harbor so we're like oh well it's gonna be this big war because remember you know the war with Iraq was supposed to be the first one was supposed to be a big deal you know um, so we went down to the uh, Marine recruiter's office that was in um, the pavilion where the pavilion theaters were near uh, Rose, Rosedale. And we'd, have, we'd filled out all the papers and everything. And then he said, you know, guys, you guys are way overqualified for this. Like you already make way more money than you're ever going to make here. Um, you know, what are you doing? And we said, uh, well, you know, the country's going to war. We, isn't, you know, that's what, that's what, you know, that's what my grandfather did. I felt like that's what you do. <laughs> he burst out laughing, ripped up the, uh, the contracts and said, guys, we appreciate your patriotism, but this thing's going to be over before you guys even get to basic. We're like, really? He's like, trust me. So we said, okay. And it's funny because I, you know, my uncle had been after me to, to join up after, join the Marine Corps after I graduated from, uh, from college. And he was really, really furious. <laughs> And my aunt told me that we'd probably met about the only Marine recruiting officer in the entire Corps who would have done that. She said, he actually, given your qualifications, the qualifications of the two of you, because they knew my friend well, they said um, he would have gotten, a, he gave up a big bonus. So, you know, I, I just really look at it as obviously uh, that wasn't what I was, what I was meant to do, you know? Um, my uncle did taunt me about that for probably five years. He was just always going on about how, you know, only Marines are the real man, blah, blah, blah. Um, I got a little tired of it after my, um, uh, after I'd been doing what was essentially MMA for six years. <laughs> it was kind of funny because I finally, I was like, yeah, come on, Uncle Chuck. And he's like, well, you know, we're trained to kill. <laughs> I'm like, I think I'll be okay. And you, if you guys know anything about, about my Uncle Chuck, he's not a big guy. Um, so anyhow, uh, after I uh, put him in a face down in a headlock, a neck breaking headlock, in approximately four seconds, for maybe five seconds, and... Uh, made him tap out and say, uncle, <laughs> he admitted that maybe you could be a real man and not be a Marine. He was, he wasn't admitting it. He was open to the possibility. And, uh, and just in case, uh, any of you might doubt that story, Space Bunny was there. She saw the whole thing. So, um, it was pretty funny. But don't get me wrong, I've, I love my Uncle Chuck. I have the greatest respect for him. I probably respect him 
more than just about anybody I've ever met or known. Um, but, you know, <laughs> five years of being constantly taunted, um, you know, when you're literally you know, training for martial arts and, and all that, um, you know, for years, it, it gets a little old. And so, um, but yeah, you know, the, the, uh, you know, I don't regret at all not serving in the military uh, because, um, you know, my experience in starting and, and being in Psychosonic, uh, which is what I was doing at the time that I would have been, been in the service, was just so interesting and amazing and cool in its own way. I'm not, I'm not comparing the two at all, but uh, obviously. But it's hard to say, gee, I wish I had done X. I mean, it's one of those things where if you had nine lives, I think it would have been fascinating to, to do that and go career, you know? Um, you know, I, I expect I probably would have done well. I certainly had the, had the connections and everything. Um, but, you know, I don't think, I mean, if you think about it, I'm in my early fifties, there's no way that I would have survived the, the career wise that I would have survived the political, um, morass that it's become. Maddie says, it could have been you fake crying on Israel for national TV. <laughs> See, that's the problem. It, that would never happen. And so, you know, the military being a fundamentally, um, <laughs> Avalanche points out, yeah, you would have been kicked out for not getting vaccinated. Yeah, so anyhow. Um, you know, I, I just thought it was really, I just thought it was really interesting that my uncle saw that I wasn't Naval Academy material. And I, I can't argue with him at all, you know. Um, in fairness, I was surprised that my cousin went, and I wasn't surprised that he washed out. He wasn't as bad as me, but we had enough in common that, that, you know, I can, I can see where, where my uncle was coming from. Anyhow, long answer to a simple question. Sorry about that. Sometimes uh, it's, it's keep in mind when I'm doing these streams, it's pretty late my time. So I'm not uh, exactly at my sharpest. Anyhow, here's the scenario. And uh, I'll probably get on, go into this in more detail uh, later. Uh, as events begin to either move in this direction or away from this direction, but they're moving in this direction right now. And remember, the ultimate goal of the neo-clowns is to get the U.S. engaged in a war with Iran. That's the big goal. And so how do you get there from here? Well, the first steps already happened you got the green flag in Gaza, and now you've got the uh, justification for the for the IDF to engage in its own reprisals and atrocities and all that sort of thing. This stirs up the Arab world, specifically and most importantly, uh, it has the potential of getting Hezbollah involved. Now, Hezbollah is much more serious than Hamas. Um, Martin Van Krebel says. Um, that Hezbollah has some of the finest light infantry in the world. I can't testify to that, but, but I'm just passing on what he's written. And, you know, they, they f did fairly well when they fought the IDF in 2006. Now, we don't know who is, uh, who's improved more since 2006, but considering that the Israeli military and the Israeli government appear to have moved in the same direction as the U.S. government, 
given the you know, connections and influence of global homo, we probably need to assume that you know, Hezbollah has probably improved since then relative to the IDF. And Hezbollah is very closely tied and supplied, um, close, connected to and supplied by Iran. But just getting, uh, just getting involved with, uh, even if Hezbollah gets seriously involved, that doesn't connect to Iran. You know, that's why you're seeing this, these ridiculous things about Iran planned, Iran planned the Gaza attacks. Okay, so that's just total, total bullshit. It is more likely that Israel planned the, the green flag than Iran did. You know, if Iran was planning it, then it would be Hezbollah. And that's why it's a concern to me that they're trying to blame something that obviously isn't Iran. Because, you know, it's, it's kind of like 9-11. You know, 9-11 had a bunch of Saudis, at, again, we're going with the official story here, it had a bunch of Saudis at the direction of a Saudi based in Afghanistan attacking the United States. So in response, the United States attacked Iraq. That's literally what happened. Makes no sense, right? So, you know, the neo clowns have been banging the drum for war with Iran since 2005. Uh, look up Faster Please by Michael Ledeen. The funny thing is, I actually, other than his like neo clown, uh, let's have America build, an, uh, build Israel an empire in the Middle East, I actually like Ledeen's uh, non, you know, non Middle East related stuff. He, he's, He's got, you know, a deep interest in, in Italy and he's written some good stuff on it. But, you know, his, he, he was ending every column for a while. He might even still be doing it. He was ending every column for a while with Faster Please, which was supposed to be his, you know, Carthago de Lenda Est sort of thing. Um, the point is, is that this uh, desired war with uh, Iran is, you know, so, you know, pushed uh, or it's 2005. So it's it's been going on for 18 years. Um, so, anyhow, the the concern is, the U.S. just moved its its most useless aircraft carrier into the Mediterranean, and you know, over on the Middle Eastern side of the Mediterranean, the the uh, USS Gerald Ford. It's a real problem ship. It's not well designed. Um, it's 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 not. It's, it's basically the the World War Three equivalent of the USS Ranger in World War Two. Um, you haven't heard of the Ranger because the Ranger was so worthless that they basically just ended up using it to train pilots to land on. So my concern would be that uh, if. If Israel uh, USS Liberties, the uh, the USS Ford, and then it gets blamed on Iran, then uh, yeah, in before remember the Ford. So uh, that's maybe what we should have titled this stream: Remember the Ford. But. Um, but you know these sorts of false flags, green flags, often involve ships. You know, remember the Maine it was a, a narrative that justified war with Spain. And so, uh, you know, if you hear that the Ford is attacked or sunk, you know it's fake. You know, whoever they blame for it didn't do it. Yeah, the Lusitania, the Maine. Um, there also um, the Gulf of Tonkin incident was used to justify U.S. military actions in Vietnam. 
And so, uh, you know, th that would be the scenario that I would be concerned about. North Star Bear asks a good question. Why do they want war with Iran in the first place? Well, they fear, Israel fears war with Iran, which is why they want the U.S. to fight Iran uh, either in their place or uh, with them because Israel probably can't beat Iran. You know, uh, they don't fear the Arab nations, but the Persians are a different gang. You know, the, the Persians are, um, they have a long, long, long and respectable military history. You know, I don't know if the Parthians were actually Persians or not, but um, you know, drone warfare is is the the most you know one of the most important aspects of warfare these days, and the Iranians make really good drones. You know, for a while, uh, Russia was being uh, attacked by the media because it was or Iran was being attacked by the media because it was claimed that they were selling their drones to Russia. Sam has a good point. He says, uh, the Ottomans couldn't push into Persia. Right. And so, um, you know, so what, what the neoclowns are, are looking for is they need to get the U.S. military enmeshed in war with Iran before they either, A, lose their influence over the U.S. military, or B, the U.S. military becomes incapable of fighting a war with Iran. Now, it could get a lot more complicated than this. We're just talking about a possible scenario from the Israeli side, and to a lesser extent from the neo-clown in the U.S. side. So, uh, think about this. If a bunch of clueless amateurs like us can figure out the possibility of that scenario, the desirability of that scenario, what are the chances that the guy who is the smartest national leader on the global scene didn't? If I can think of this, what are the chances that the chief ideologist of the Chinese uh, Communist Party, who was 12 years ahead of me on pretty much everything. What are the chances that they didn't see it? And so, you know, what we could see is um, that this green flag was actually inspired by either Russia or more likely China. China actually knows Israel pretty well. And so you know, all of this, this stuff that um, the neoclowns think they're getting away with might actually be playing into the long-term World War III plans of the Sino-Russian-Iranian alliance. I have no idea. I have no idea. I mean, just to be clear, you know, this is just like a, a game designer, holistic approach. You know, it, it's a conceivable possibility for which there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever. But it does point out the difficulty of actually having any idea what's going on. Uh, we have a very generous uh, super chat from Graced Bear. Uh, small show of gratitude. I'm retarded. Hope this helps a smidge back to listening. Well, you know, it never hurts to pay the retardery away. Um, Dan and Georgia says, so many Israel First churches around here. Yeah, that's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's such bad theology that's embarrassing. You know, 
It's like demonstrating that your pastor doesn't read the Bible. Your thoughts on China's reaction? Well, China's reaction is, is typical. Totally non-committal, uh, totally refusing to play along with the media narrative. You know, China has made it clear that they're pro-Palestinian. And um, for some reason, my monitor just went to sleep, I think. Let me see if I can get it back. Oh, there we go. Um, and so, you know, the important thing is to understand how little we know and that what we think we know may or may not be real. And the, even if it's real, the explanation that we're getting for it is probably less than entirely accurate if it's coming from the mainstream media. So, you know, don't get your panties in a bunch. This does not mean the world is about to end. I'm going to do a stream talking about the theology um, of these things because, you know, I grew up around, um, my, my parents aren't boomers, but a lot of their friends were. And so I grew up around uh, very boomer adults who were, of course, convinced that <laughs> Yeah, they didn't know when the world was going to end, but they knew it was going to happen in their lifetime. You know, so um, Dan in Georgia says 101st Airborne is in Jordan now. Well, that's not a good sign. But anyhow, um, before I go, uh, I do have one thing to uh, announce and show you. Um, we just submitted this today. And so we'll probably announce it in a, in a day or three once it's actually available on, on Amazon and so forth. But um, my collection of short stories called The Altar of Hate is now, uh, has now been submitted, will be available soon on Amazon and at Arkhaven. Uh, I'll read you the back of it because you probably can't see it very clearly. Uh, Vox Day is one of the most intelligent, most eclectic, and most dangerous writers of his generation. With a literary range that spans from economic analysis and philosophy to epic fantasy and science fiction, he has been banned from every major social media platform and is forbidden by name from setting foot inside Google's California headquarters. And then there's a, a quote uh, from Patrick Nielsen Hayden of Tor Books. Vox Day rises all the way to downright evil. The Altar of Hate is a collection of his short fiction that is unrelated to his Arts of Dark and Light or his Quantum Mortis series. They include tales of blood feuds in Venice, scientific genocide, cyberpunk, and the selling of infernal machines. So, um, so anyhow, I just thought that uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna make a claim to be a dangerous writer and so forth, um, you know, you need to, you need to back it up. Plus that quote makes me laugh. Um, Anthony says, the cover slut says that is a good cover, nine out of 10. Yeah, I think it's good. I think it's good and I like it a lot. Um, I actually have that mask. I have a real mask. Um, the Kurgan had it made in Venice for me, so. Um, but yeah, it's got a new story. It's actually got several, um, several new stories in it, and two of which were did uh, appear, because you know, I released this in ebook form back in 2014. But um, I added two uh, short stories that were published in um, Riding the Red Horse and There Will Be War, and then also published. Um, Two of the poems, so uh, Once Our Land, you've probably read that on the blog, and also um, the, the one about Bain, the old reader that um, that passed away a few years ago. Uh, just a, a poem that I had written him as a tribute after he died. And then, of course, it's got a, a brand new story um, called Shinjuku Satan, um, very cyberpunk um some of you are going to love it. 
some of you are going to absolutely hate it. Um, but you know, I wanted to write, uh, I wanted to write a full throttle. I mean, if, it's probably the first thing that I've ever written that I would say is full throttle me. You know, um, for various reasons, I've always felt the need to sort of hold back a little, restrain myself a little, that sort of thing. I'm at the age now where, you know, I don't have a literary career. Um, you know, Dan and George says, the throne of bones and how to succeed like a dark lord is disturbing. Um, yeah, you might not like this whole collection all that well. You know, um, Maddie I says, the one from the blog, the intro is pretty slick. Yeah, that's the one. Um, to be honest, I, I honestly think a more accurate title would have been Shinjuku Nichi, <laughs> but it doesn't have the same ring to it. You know what I mean? Um, and so, you know, uh, you know, it, it's not something that, I mean, obviously it's not something that I'm going to apologize for. I'm just letting you know that uh, it's not, uh, you know, this is not Selenoth fiction. This is not Quantum Mortis fiction. Uh, this is just, you know, um, it, I guess of all the fiction and stuff that I've written, it's it's more Midnight's War. And so, um, you know, I mean, the funny thing is, is that I do not watch horror movies. Um, I don't, I don't like the, the negative influences and that sort of thing. But at the same time, you know, I feel like when I'm, if I'm painting a picture with words, I prefer to use the entire, um, I prefer to use the entire palette. You know, Mowgli says, does it include your Maupassant short story? It includes both my Maupassant short stories. Um, you're thinking of the deported, most likely. But even though it's very, very techno, uh, the log file is actually even more of a Maupassant story. Basically, the log file is a techno rewrite of an actual Maupassant short story. The Deported is my attempt to write a short story in Maupassant style that leaves the reader with a similar feeling that he gets from reading a Maupassant short story, if that makes any sense. So, and it actually worked out really well because the log file and Shinjuku Satan are, um, I think very closely linked thematically. It wasn't intentional. Um, you know, the, the reason that I, and also the reason that I wrote Shinjuku Satan was because uh, Bruce Bethke has a cyberpunk uh, anniversary issue coming out. And, um, you know, I just wanted to, I thought, oh, well, you know, in case he needs a story, I'll write it. <laughs> the thing I forgot is that um, you know Bruce still has good relations with the uh, you know wider science fiction writing community, and so I have a feeling that if I were if he was to publish one of my stories, you know he'd probably lose like five to ten other sub, you know submissions that he was planning to publish. So anyhow, uh, I hope you'll consider picking up a copy uh, of the hardcover. This is going to be published not in paperback, but oops, wrong one. This is going to be published in hardcover. Um, just, I think it's going to be a nice, a nice, uh, beautiful addition to to a library. And so, uh, and as always, if you buy the hardcover from the Arkhaven store, the ebook will be included. So, um, anyhow, that's all I've got for tonight. So, thank you for tuning in. I appreciate the super chats, and uh, you know, just remember. What you're seeing 
may or may not be real, and it probably isn't entirely true. I'm Vox Day, and this is The Dark Stream.